Welcome to The Long Way Round. My name's Malcolm Byrne. And uh, thanks, Jokison. And as you were talking, I was looking out the window. <laughs> it looks like we're going to have another tornado. I was like, oh boy, he's calling up the gods of wrath. <laughs> anyway, thanks for First Voices. Always, always a great program. I don't know if you were paying attention, but uh, what price electric cars you know, you trade one problem for another, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, um, welcome to the show. Uh, I have a very special guest. This is someone I've been um, listening to and paying attention to for many, many years. I'm probably going on 20 or so more years. Uh, Scott Ritter is a former Marine intelligence officer who served in the former <clears throat> Soviet Union, implementing arms control agreements, and on the staff of the no General Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, on the staff of General Norman Schwarzkopf during the Gulf War, where he played a critical role in the hunt for Iraqi Scud missiles. From 1991 until 1998, Scott served as a chief inspector for the United Nations in Iraq, leading the search for Iraq's prescribed, proscribed, sorry, weapons of mass destruction. And we all know how that worked out. Scott was a vocal critic of the American decision to go to war with Iraq. He's the author of nine books and is widely interviewed Scott's latest book, which was just published by Charity Press, is titled Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika, Arms Control and the End of the Soviet Union, published by Charity Press. Uh, this book is the definitive history of the implementation of the Immediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty signed by Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan in all its complexities and the links both sides went to trust but verify this successful and unique historic disarmament process. Welcome, Scott, to The Long Way Round. Thanks for joining me here. <laughs> Sorry? Well, thank, thank uh, you very much for having me. There we go. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Boy, you know, they could put... When did they put a man on the moon? About 50-something uh, years ago. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still at the radio station pressing buttons going, which one works? <laughs> Turn his voice on. Um Anyway, you know, as I said most sincerely, I, you, you've been someone that uh, I've, I've been listening to and paying attention for, to for a very long time. Uh, you know, my my thoughts go back to those dark days after 9-11 uh, leading up to the war with Iraq and even the, the events prior to that that you were involved with. And, and it just, <laughs> you know, I, I just can't, I got to sort of ask you where do you get the strength to carry on? Do you know if well I, I mean what other option do you have um I, I you know I have to admit to some uh, no no small amount of uh, burnout um especially after the Iraq war came to be uh you know I, I I poured my heart and soul into trying to stop that war I did everything humanly possible um and beyond, um, I put my family at risk. I, uh, you know, I, I threw myself into, you know, it, it just, it just, you know, it came as close to destroying me as, 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 as possible. Um, and, you know, I've been, you know, rebuilding ever since then, but, um, I've been rebuilding with a more of a pragmatic approach, mm -hmm. <laughs> a fact-based analysis approach, um, as opposed to, um, you know, the emotional uh, approach that you have as a true believer. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, 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 I I've recaptured some of that. Um, I, I think that's where a, a lot of people have, you know, you've become, again, quite well-known on, on YouTube. Yeah. And I think that's because people are so desperate for something that, you know, two and two actually does make four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can make fun of the military all you want, but sometimes military math is is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I have great respect. I mean, my father was a sergeant in the British Army. He was a demolitions expert for during the Korean War. So, you know, I mean, I tip my hat to you. But, um, you know, I've got so many questions. And, and our, my, our dear, uh, my dear producer, Liz Hill, went to a great amount of effort to put some questions together as well. And, of course, we have a selection of music, which I really don't want to uh, not uh, get to, because, you know, music, <laughs> as before you came on, I was listening to, 
to the music and I was like, boy, you know, there's something about listening to music. It's just so pure and natural, you know? Um, it is. <laughs> so so I want to go through that, but uh, I do have a few questions I'd, I really want to ask you. Uh, well, I'm going to start off with a statement, and I think you've said it many times, is those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Or, as Mark Twain said, at least it rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's not necessarily worth a ping-pong back comment, but I just thought I'd start off on that sentiment. But, you know, yourself and... and um, Professor Stephen uh, Cohen. I don't know if you knew Stephen. I, I, I never met him personally, but I I followed him um, assiduously. He, uh, I, I, you know, he was the rush the go to Russian expert um, for me um, when when I needed to tell because I, I I consider myself to be a specialist in Russian affairs and Soviet affairs. I, I wouldn't quite elevate myself to expert status. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable, but you know, it's a complicated topic. And, uh, when I'd start wrestling with ideas in my head, um, you know, he was the beacon of light that I'd turn to, 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 to find the solution to the problem. And he invariably was able to guide me, uh, you know, to, you know, down a, down a path, down a journey to, uh, to figure out, you know what was going on in Russia. Um, I, I have nothing but, or have had, have um, I, nothing but respect. I respect who he was. I respect, um, you know, who, what he stands for today. I mean, you know, even though he's no longer on on the earth, uh, you know, this is a man who has a lifetime of um, experience that has been captured in writing, um, on audio tape, on videotape. He, if if you can track down, you know, something that Steve, that his Mr. Cohen was involved in, um, archive it because that is a library of knowledge that mm. this country desperately needs to tap into today. I agree. I, I think his, um, his wife, um, uh, uh, gosh, Menderhoven, she, she, Katerina, Katerina, I think she's kind of carrying on the, carrying the torch for him. Yeah. She was, God bless her. Seems yeah. to be very supportive. Um, but the reason I'm saying that is because I'm, I'm, I just, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I know that one of the important things we want to do is make sure we promote your new book. <laughs> so in, in light of that, I, I had been reading as much as I, as I could before we got onto the show, but I did read a review and there's a passage from this review, uh, pardon, it's Russian state television, but, uh, <laughs> whatever. Oh um, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, perhaps the, the the review says in regards to your book, it says perhaps the main tape takeaway from Ritter's book, however, is the example it sets at a time when the specter of another world war looks increasingly imminent. Despite being ideological foes, diplomats and statesmen from the Soviet Union and the United States always managed to find ways to bridge the gap separating them, even when the question came down to eliminating the most dangerous weapons on Earth. And I just thought, you know, boy... If, if there is a connection between you and Stephen, that's that's kind of it, you know, because he had written that book, in War with Russia, and it's like, what is going on? What do you what do you think in the blood, so to speak, with this almost like war psychosis that's taken over? Well, you know, it's <laughs> your your statement is absolutely right. Uh, you know, what you started out with uh, those who uh, <laughs> who refuse to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it, or at least rhyme. Um, the um, we've done, we've gone down this road before. I went down this road before. Uh, you know, I I joined the Marine Corps, and this is the straight up God's honest truth to kill Russians. I joined because my father was a career Air Force officer during the Cold War. Um, the, his last tours of duty that that you know that I was involved in as a as as a dependent uh, were in Turkey. Um, which is on the front line at the time of the front lines of the, uh, of the cold war. I write about it in the book. Uh, I, I, I think people will be shocked just how many top secret intelligence and military programs were going on in Turkey at the time, um, focused against the Soviet union. And then to West Germany, uh, where literally across the border was nearly a million Soviet troops, um, you know, who were organized, equipped, trained and prepared to launch an invasion of 
uh, West Germany that would put it in mortal conflict with the U.S. military, of which my dad was a part. And you know, my father would disappear into bunkers um, every once in a while, uh, you know, that, that were designed to withstand nuclear blasts, where our home was located less than one and a half miles away from a place called North Point, which was a nuclear weapons storage facility for the United States Army, uh, sort of a premier target for the Soviet Union if they were going to launch an attack. So every time my father disappeared, we realized that if the balloon went up, we were dead. It was over. Uh, so we get on the school bus and, and go to Kaiserslautern American High School to attend class. But in the back of our minds was, what if whatever it is that caused my father to go down in the bunker came to fruition? What if those 80 aircraft we see flying over aren't doing an exercise, but this is real? Yeah. Um, you know, this was this was the reality. And so I made it my mission to join the United States military so that I could defend my country and our allies against the Soviet threat. I joined the Marine Corps because it was the most elite killing machine I could put, you know, sign up to. Um, and I, I spent a couple of years in the deserts of 29 Palms, California, perfecting the art of killing Russians. Um, and, you know, it, while I was learning how to do it as a Marine, you know, both the United States and the Soviet Union were uh, deploying these weapons of mass destruction, these intermediate nuclear range missiles, nuclear tipped, um, that basically meant that if they ever were fired, you were seven to 12 minutes away from American missile hitting the Kremlin, which means the Kremlin no longer had any time to consider anything. So if there was an accident, we accidentally fired, they would hit the button and fire everything back. The world ends. This was the reality of the 1980s. It was as dangerous or more dangerous than the situation we face today. And people, some, you know, as bad as the Russophobia is, you know, back then, it, the Soviet Union was the evil empire, the evil empire with a capital T, capital E. Um, the, the slogans, better dead than red, were real. Better die than become communist. Hmm. Uh, kill a commie for mommy wasn't something to chuckle at, baby. That's what we believed in. And, uh, you know, that that kind of hate field vindictive um, exceeds what we have in America today. In America today, we have ignorance. We didn't have ignorance back in the 1980s. We were well informed about the Soviets. We studied them. We knew them uh, to an intimacy that doesn't exist today. Americans today are just ignorant, plain ignorant about Russia. They don't know anything about Russia, so they'll believe anything about Russia. We knew a lot about Russia, but we put that knowledge through a filter that focused on turning this knowledge into hate. Because, you know, if you're going to go to war, you don't kill people you like. <laughs> you don't kill people well, human that you want to be friends with. Human beings you have to met. learn to hate. And we did hate. And this is a long way of coming up to all of a sudden, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev sat down in December of 1987 and signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Six months later, I'm on an airplane flying to the Soviet Union as part of the advance party to implement this new treaty to build something that had never been built before in the heart of the evil empire outside the walls of a missile factory that produced missiles for the sole purpose of killing American cities. And the people helping me build this were Russians. They became my colleagues. Well, let, me, let me ask you a question. Where do you think, because I was thinking, because I lived through, you know, uh, perestroika, I was you know, a teenager in the seventies, and you know, I, I, you know, where I grew up, I mean, even in Canada, there was always this looming threat of, you know, nuclear war. You know, it was always just something that you thought about. And and my point being is, where do you think that kind of coming together of the way they did then? What do you think's the difference between now and then? In, in a sense, like was there just this general sense of shared mutual destruction that we were, they were we were both 
so scared of that we just fought, figured we got to do this otherwise nobody's going to survive or or was there some other driving force and what do you think's driving this ignorance as you say now well i mean the 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 concept of the present day ignorance uh helps answer your question because we weren't ignorant back then um we were operating from a position of certainty derived from an interpretation of a fairly complete data set. We could point on a map and show you where the Soviet Union was. Uh, We could point on a map and show you where Moscow was. Uh, We were cognizant of what the Soviet Union was. Um, You know, even in the military, you know, we had categories of people we called foreign affair, excuse me, um, foreign area officers. These are experts on the Soviet Union. Um, they studied the language. They got high. They, they got advanced degrees uh, in Russian area studies. Uh, they were immersed in the language and the culture. Um, and then they went off to spy on the Soviets or to do other things on the Soviets because the Soviets were the enemy. Um, how it came together is, you know, I may have hated the Soviets enough to try and kill them if we had to go to war. But I respected the hell out of them. I respected them. They were my equals. Mm. They were a worthy foe, a worthy enemy. So we were never dismissive of them. We always treated them with respect. Um, We didn't have to agree with them, but when we sat down across from them, we were sitting down against a peer, Mm. somebody who was, you know, our equal. Um, Today, you know, we, we, we have been twisted. And remember, the foreign area officers of the 1970s, 1980s um, were born from the experience of the Second World War, where the Soviet Union took the lead in defeating Nazi Germany. Right. I mean, you, again, we can be as proud as we should be about the role played by the United States military in defeating both Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany. But we can't be um, fooled into believing that we were the dominant force. Um, the Soviet Union took on the bulk of Nazi Germany's forces and defeated them at a huge cost, a horrific cost yeah, to say. them. Um, but our experiences were born of that. So our foundation of dealing with the Soviet Union back then was one born of absolute respect for for what they did during the Second World War, what they accomplished. Um, When the Soviet Union dissolved in 1992, 1991, 1992, we we, we entered the decade of the 90s where we weren't dealing with an equal anymore. We're dealing with a defeated nation. We viewed ourselves as having won the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Russia was a defeated nation now. There was no more Soviet Union. the, the approach taken by Russian area studies where we were training people to learn about our peers no longer applied. We now had Russian area studies programs that were training people on how to exploit a defeated enemy. And that's the God's honest truth. Stephen Cohen would tell you that straight up, that Russian area studies programs uh, devolved. They produced people like Michael McFall, mm. who went on to become an ambassador. He's not somebody who respects Russia. He hates Russia. He has his disdain for Russia. Um, And you can see that in the way he talks about Russia. He doesn't have an appreciation for the history of Russia. He instead talks about the history of Russia as interpreted by a victorious America, where we assume that the proper role of Russia is to be subservient to the United States, where we felt that it was normal for us to buy an election. I mean, I, I'm not talking about the 2016 election here, 2016. I'm talking about the 1996 election in this, in Russia where we bought Boris Yeltsin's re-election, literally bought it. We went in there, spent money, we bragged about it, put it on the cover of Time magazine. So this approach of disdain, disrespect, dismissal um, means that when somebody like Vladimir Putin comes into power after Boris Yeltsin and tries to restore Russia to what Russia believes is its um, 
is the position it belongs, not as the world superpower, but as, as a, a power. Equal um, we resent this. We resent Russia trying to reassert itself as a major player in the world. We therefore interpret that everything Russia is doing, rather than saying this is a normal process involved in a nation restoring itself to its rightful position, we viewed it instead as a nation not understanding that its rightful position is to be permanently subordinated to us. Um, and we viewed everything Putin does, says, thinks, even even though we don't know what he thinks, we pretend <laughs> we know what he thinks. Right. I mean, think about it. How many people have said that's straight out of Putin's playbook? Uh, who has oh, really who, who's got that show playbook? me the playbook? <laughs> show me the playbook. Well, let, let me just interject. <laughs> let me just interject and say that. You know, it, it seems to me, because what you're saying, as I interpret it, is that there's, from the top down, there's a complete disdain, a lack of understanding, you know, so it, it would seem that it's a double-edged sword in the sense that, it, on the one hand, it's led to this, I was going to say disaster, military disaster in Ukraine, now I'm going to call it a military fiasco, because it's just, <laughs> it's, I mean, if it wasn't human beings being killed, I, it would almost be comical. You know, and on the other hand, as you pointed out, there's this sense from the probably the Russian people, you know, that hey, you know, we're not just a third rate country and we're going to show you, <laughs> you know, so it's almost like these two negative forces have created this situation where n nobody understands, <laughs> at least in our, in our, well, the events. frustrating thing about this is that. The Russians have actually been the adults in the room from the very beginning of, of, of Vladimir Putin's tenure as president. Uh, literally, you cannot go back and find a single major mistake. He's not perfect. He makes mistakes. But when it comes to foreign policy, national security policy, and even domestic policy, People have to understand that the starting point of Vladimir Putin's tenure as president was the absolute ruin of Russia because of what the West had done. We had built these classes of oligarchs who had enriched themselves at the expense of the Russian people, transferring their wealth outside of Russia. Um, we had dismantled everything that made Russia great. We had destroyed democracy, uh, pretending there was democracy. Um, and so Putin comes rolling in and says, I'm going to fix this. And um, everything he has done has been focused on fixing that, which we created. Uh, he, you know, we, we need to be careful. And I, I, I have been corrected many times by Russians who say, hey, uh, quit imprinting us <laughs> with your American uh, prejudices and your American uh, tendencies. And what they meant by that is um, <laughs> I'm a revenge oriented person. <laughs> I mean, I think most Americans are. You bomb me. I'm going to kill you. I mean, we have country and Western music written about this. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you know it's serious. Well, well, um, the land of the free, the, home of the brave. <laughs> yeah, but the, the uh, you know, the, the, the thing is the Russians aren't, weren't trying to get revenge on anybody. I mean, we've interpreted it as revenge, but the Russians have actually been very assiduous in explaining their position to us. Go back and listen to every speech Putin has ever given. He's straight up telling us what the problem is, what the solution is, what he's going to do. There are no secrets. It's not like Michael McFall being caught out in a recent uh, interview where he acknowledged he lied, straight up lied. And when, when confronted by that, he said, come on, it's the real world. This well, is what we do. Well, that's a bit like well, that the, uh, interview. The Russians don't lie. <laughs> it's like that interview with, uh, with John Bolton. You know, it's like yeah. Flo Coo. Frodians, what well, we, we do it all They're the They're not as easy as you think, what, you know. <laughs> it's what we do. But, you know, one of the problems is that we, we don't take the time as a nation to understand the Russian way of doing business. And what I mean by that is the way they make policy, how their civil service, 
you know, works across one of the, lar- the largest country in the world, multiple time zones, all the complexities that we can't even begin to grasp as, as Americans. And they coordinate from the grassroots on up policy that is brought together in Moscow um, where the executive makes decisions. We keep saying Vladimir Putin does this, Vladimir Putin does that. Vladimir Putin's one man running one of the big, running the biggest country in the world, one of the most complex countries in the world, 130 ethnicities in Russia. Hey, so let's zone. stop <laughs> us talking about the Russians. It's a lot of people in Russia that aren't Russians who believe in the Russian Federation. Um, and so Putin is, is guiding this and we don't respect Russia when we say it's all about Putin. No, it's all about Russia. And Russia has been very patient. Russia has been very mature. And Russia has been, um, you know, granting a lot of latitude to the West. It's only when we have backed Russia into a corner and given Russia no other option that they are now undertaking decisive action in the form of this special military operation, invasion, whatever term you want to use in Ukraine. But it's still not revenge oriented. You will not find the level of hate that existed in the United States before we invaded Iraq or before we we went into Afghanistan. Because when we go to war as a nation, it is a hate-based conflict. We hated Saddam Hussein. We hated the Taliban. We hated Al-Qaeda. We hated Osama bin Laden. And that's what drove us. Vengeance drove us. There ain't no vengeance going on in Russia right now. This is one of the saddest conflicts in Russian history, and the Russians will tell you that. They did not want to fight this war. This war is a battle between Slavic brothers. The Russians and the Ukrainians are not separate people. Back in the Soviet Union time, they intermingled. You scratch a Russian, you have a Ukrainian mother. You scratch a Ukrainian, you have a Russian father, uh, and that's just the way it works. This war hurts, hurts the Russians in a way America will never understand, um, which is why we in America today are, you know, we keep trying to imprint on the Russians our beliefs, our prejudices, our way of doing business, instead of saying, let's try and approach this from the standpoint of the Russians. And believe me, the moment you try and do that, you know, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, the moment you do that, the picture changes completely, but we're just not, we're not willing to do that as a, as a, as a collective. Mm. Scott, we need to go to a, a promo break. Um, so we will be right back with Scott Ritter. Stay tuned after these most important messages. Radio Kingston has its own bilingual newsletter. Radio Kingston tiene su propio boletín bilingüe. You can find out great. what we've been working on. Puedes enterarte en qué estamos trabajando. And learn more about the shows you love and shows you may want to learn more about. Y aprender sobre los programas que más te gustan y los programas que todavía no conoces. There's an audio version too. También hay una versión de audio. Let us know what else you'd like to find. Go to our contact page at radiokingston.org. ¿Qué más te gustaría encontrar? Recuerda suscribirte en nuestra página web radiokingston.org. Hunger doesn't take a vacation, and you can help us bag summer hunger. Hi, this is Christine Hine, Executive Director of People's Place. Summertime is usually a most anticipated time of year for children, but for thousands of Ulster County children, it is a time of worry, worrying about how they're going to eat. These are the children who rely on schools for breakfast and lunch, and that's why People's Place is offering Bag Summer Hunger, a free program providing breakfast, lunch, and snack foods to low-income school-aged children. Families on tight budgets have difficulty absorbing the additional meal costs while school is out of session, leading to children experiencing hunger, malnutrition, and anxiety. Please donate online to peoplesplaceuc.org or send a donation to 17 St. James Street, Kingston, 12401. No child should ever go hungry, and together, every Ulster County child will be able to return to school healthy and ready to learn this September. Hi, I am Blake File. Join me Tuesday nights at 10 p.m. for The File File. Socially, politically, economically, environmentally, and spiritually, 
Our progress depends on intergenerational dialogues. Because so much about modern life, it's pinballing our physiology all over the place. I could almost feed that text in and have the relationship I want with my mother. I just tried to fill out this magical world purely for my own delight. And really great music. The File File, Tuesday nights at 10, here on Radio Kingston, AM 1490, FM 107.9, and anytime at radiokingston.org. Hi, I'm Malcolm Byrne, and you're listening to The Long Way Round here on Radio Kingston. And if you're just tuning in, naughty, naughty, you you should have been here on time. You've missed some very good conversations with my uh, extremely, extraordinary guest, Scott Ritter. Author Scott Ritter is here to talk about his book, that he's just put out called Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika. It's a very uh, worthwhile, entertaining, and incredibly informative, I must say. I mean, I had no idea about a lot of those details. I mean, even the uh, the statue, Good versus Evil, that's just <laughs> such a great way to start the book. You know, like, do, can you talk about that statue just for a second? Because I think it's very symbolic. Sure. Well, the, the, the statue uh, can be found in... Um, in Midtown Manhattan, um, on the property of the United Nations um, headquarters. Uh, it's a statue that was um, donated to the United Nations by the Soviet Union. Um, it was uh, actually, um, uh, I don't know if you say built. Do you build statues? Uh, it was construct or build. Construct a statue. It's, it's a work of art. Uh, and, and, a, and a Georgian artist. And, and what's interesting about Georgian is uh, my wife's from Georgia. Uh, she's, she's Georgia, from Georgia in Re- Republic of Georgia. Yeah, yeah not so Georgia, this is a Republic, to Alabama. Yeah, not, not Atlanta, Georgia, <laughs> uh, the Republic of Georgia. And a Georgian artist put this together. Uh, and it's made out of um, pieces of um, missiles that were destroyed during the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And these missiles have been uh, uh, put together uh, in the form of a dragon. And uh, the, 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 the statue shows St. George, uh, the patron saint of Georgia, um, uh, driving his lance. He's on horseback, and he's, the horse is reared up over this dragon that's made out of these missiles, and he's driving the lance through the, uh, through the missiles. Uh, you know, and it's, it's called uh, good, good Defeats Evil. It's, this, it's, it's basically a statue in honor of the disarmament process uh, that I had... Uh, that I had uh, played a played a role in, um, you know, and uh, it, it's just a statue that resonates with me, um, you know, in in, in so many ways. Um, you know, it, it's about you know my wife. It's about her homeland. It's about um, the treaty that I was involved in. It's a, it was about disarmament. You know, when I saw when I first encountered that statue, that was in September 1991. I mean, uh, like, as I was 30 years headed, ago, it's 30, more than 30 years ago for people yeah, who don't remember but, <laughs> or weren't but I was, born I, yet. I was yeah. um, done with my tour in the Soviet Union. I had just come back from the war, the Gulf War, and I was actually on my way to the United Nations to begin my new life as a weapons inspector going into Iraq. And fun, so fun, this fun. Uh, <laughs> this statue is just symbolic in, in every possible way. Wow. So that's why I used it to start the book off. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic, and I, I love the way you talk about that in the book, you know, just walking, you know, through New York and suddenly coming across. And, you know, it's 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 parts of two, it's the, the uh, Patriot two missiles and the, what were the Russian missiles? No, it was, it, it was the, um, the, the Pershing two Pershing missile, two. the American Pershing. missile, and Sorry. then the uh, SS-20 uh, missile. Um, from the from the Soviets, so they were sort of the co-equivalent missile system. Yeah, they were the ones. The the, the deployment of the SS twenty missiles by the Soviet Union in the nineteen seventies uh, just threw the balance of power askew in Europe, um, uh, and so the response by the United States was to deploy uh, Pershing two missiles and ground launched cruise missiles. The Pershing two missile was especially um, considered a threat by the Soviets because of the speed, meaning that once it was launched, it would hit the Kremlin um, in nine to 12 minutes. And um, this was an unacceptable threat uh, to the um, 
to the Soviets. So it, it actually, by deploying this missile, we actually put the world uh, on, on, on the brink of uh, nuclear annihilation, um, at which the good news was, uh, the bad news was, we're on the brink of nuclear annihilation. <laughs> the good news was, uh, the realization of that was the impetus necessary to get the United States and the Soviet Union to sit down and finalize the treaty to get rid of these weapons. Hmm. And, you know, I'll just bring this up. We did it once. I mean, today, the people might just be living in, you know, in, in some despair about how do we get out of this mess that we're in. Ladies and gentlemen, we were in a mess before. We got out of it. We did it. I was part of that process. And I'm here to tell you, we can do it again. It is not mission impossible. It's not even mission improbable. It is mission possible. We can do it and we must do it if we are to survive. We literally are once again at that same cliff we were staring over in 1987. But this time we actually have a roadmap on how to get out of there. We just need to rebuild the foundation and we touched upon this and I won't, I won't beat a dead horse, but we have to become knowledgeable about Russia. We have to become knowledgeable about that. You know, what, where, where does fear come from? Fear not, comes not from knowing, not knowing. the unknown, yes. ignorance. And the best way to overcome fear is to empower yourself with knowledge and information. And if you're living in fear about Russia today, learn about Russia study Russia. And what you will find is not only is there nothing to fear from Russia, but there's so much to celebrate about Russia. Just like Russians need to study us, mm -hmm. stop fearing us and learn to celebrate us, not as superiors, but as humans, humans, you know, Russians aren't Americans and Americans aren't Russia and we never will be. Russians are Russians and they should be evaluated as such. The good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. Um, but the, the important thing is to evaluate them from a place of fact-based knowledge, not this ignorance that's just got is washing over America. Every time you turn on the TV, uh, you know, open up a newspaper, read a journal, uh, log into the internet. It's just ignorance, 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 and that ignorance leads to the fear that then empowers these policies that are leading us like lemmings over the cliff. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, say two, I'll say two things to that. You know, the first thing is, you know, I, I just don't see, at least in the West, and I'm talking about United States, Canada, which is where I'm from, uh, you know, uh, United Kingdom, you know, it, there just seems no, no political will to do anything other than what the, the arms industry and so forth is, you know, it, it just seems like the propaganda machine is complete on both sides. <laughs> you know, it, you know, this, this 35, 40 year mind washing thing that's happened with, you know, cable t news, you know, you watch, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, read uh, Matt Taibbi's book, um, Hate Inc., you know, where in the front cover, it's a blue and red cover with, Sean Hannity on one side and Rachel Maddow and they're both yelling and it's just, you know, <laughs> it's all just part of that game, you know, and I mean, we don't, I don't know what, when, when you have the, the like the quote squad, you know, the progressive Democrats in uh, Washington, you know, symbolically getting themselves handcuffed in support of abortion rights, but then voting for yet another <laughs> trillion billion dollar military spending bill you, yeah. you just think where's the will to, to for anything to be different you know no you're you look <laughs> this ain't going to be easy but nothing good ever is um what what i will will say though is while the solution is similar to what you know, what, what, what eventually resolved this problem in the 1980s, the mechanism is much different. Um, first of all, you, you hit the nail on the head, this 24 hour news cycle that we have going this, uh, this, this need for instantaneous news, you know, what didn't exist in 1987 cable TV, right? Um, not, you know, you know what else didn't exist? A smartphone. 
the internet. Um, people actually had to Twitter. work <laughs> to get informed. So you were banned from Twitter, were you? I am banned from Twitter. I'm oh, a boy. bad man for, well, for, for you... engaging in fact-based uh, discussion and discourse. Uh, well, this had, is, this George, is the problem. I had George Galloway on a couple of weeks ago, and he, he <laughs> when you go to t George's um, Twitter account, it says Russian-affiliated state media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, George <laughs> Galloway is Russian. I, no. Um, no. But this is the kind of stupidity that exists. But the it, it, it's different, but the beauty is this chaos that exists right now is actually empowering the individual. If the individual would just recognize that, you know, instead, you know, we, we continue to try to, you know, gain sucker from the same central authority that we did back in the eighties, but we don't have Walter Cronkite anymore. We have people who aren't Walter Cronkite. John Hannity. Well, I wonder how many of these piece of play people that talk about it have ever been you know, within a thousand miles of an actual armed confrontation. You no, know? Uh, no. And, and, and those that have have sold their souls to, to a corporation. Uh, look, I'll, I'll just be straight up. There's a lot of generals and colonels on TV today. Um, none of them are on TV because they're telling the truth. All of them are on TV because they're being paid per appearance um, to say things that have been pre-screened by a network or a, a you know a a, 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 a a program producer who pre-interviews them says this is what I want to talk about this is the question how are you going to answer and if what you say passes the litmus test then you get to go on TV and get paid and you know this is very Pavlovian what's happened here because these guys who used to maybe at one time be genuine military experts no longer qualify as such because they're not tapping into their experience to share insight with the American people. What they're doing is prostituting their resume to reform a narrative that meets a political objective of a politicized network uh, that's being you know, uh, pushed in a direction by a producer that's answering to a business executive that says, we don't need to inform the public. We need to entertain the public. We need the public to tune in, be entertained so we can raise our advertising you know, dollars. That's how we get our income. So American people have been fooled into believing what they're getting from the media is information. It's not. It's 100% garbage-based propaganda. Mm. But the, today we have options. They can listen to your radio show. They can listen to podcasts. They can log in and, and, and read things and then decide themselves what they want to believe. You no longer are held hostage by the corporation unless you choose to be held hostage well, by the I corporation. Mean, I, I think sometimes for people, I mean, I, you know, going back, when was it? Yeah, 20 years now when the invasion of Iraq in 2000 two or three, whatever it was, was imminent. And I remember talking to my neighbor, I was handing out pamphlets, like, no, no war. <laughs> and he was like, what, what's this nonsense? What are we supposed to wait until they nuke us? You know, it's like, what, where did you get that from? And uh, and one of the things that he said struck me was that, you know, I'm a busy guy. I've got three kids. I'm trying to renovate my house. I'm a, you know, I do this very complex, difficult job. And then my wife works. We don't have time to like take that little deeper dive to get underneath the headlines, you know, and that's why, for example, I like having someone like yourself, and I highly recommend your book. I'm going to keep plugging it. Um, the Armament in the Age of... Sorry. <laughs> you say it. <laughs> I need some water. Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika. I'm so, so, so sorry. Because, you know, it, getting un underneath the facts is where, what we have to do, and it's almost like a p civic duty for people, I think, to do that. Yeah, but, but, but let me... Let me put a counter to that because, you know, I've heard the same thing. Um, I, I, I'm i getting older now, but 20 years ago, I still would go out on, on Monday night with my buddies and watch Monday night football at a bar. Um, and we would sit down and we'd get wings and we'd get some beers and we'd watch, you know, the, the, the football game and we'd talk. And invariably, you know, at that time, I was uh, very prominent in my anti-war position. 
And um, they would, you know, we we talk and they say, well, you know, but Rush Limbaugh said this or Sean Hannity said this or, you know, so-and-so said this. And, uh, and, I, and I'd say, guys, but you're talking, you're talking to the chief weapons inspector. <laughs> I did this for seven years. I am the central focal point through which all the information went through. I was not only in the capitals meeting national leaders and international leaders. I was on the ground in Iraq implementing it. And then I was going back and meeting with the intelligence heads and reformulating data. There's nothing going on that I don't know. So why don't you trust me? Well, it's complicated, Scott. You see, we all work. We have complicated jobs. We, you know, da, 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 same thing they said. And then we're watching the game and lo and behold, coach called, you know, a, 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 a fullback rush on a third and two. And uh, they said, why did I do that? That's statistically, that's the dumbest play right there. They've got, you know, the, the, their defense stops this 86% of the time. We should have done this, that, and the other. And I went, whoa, where do you guys get this data? <laughs> oh, well, we, we follow sports, man. I said, so wait a minute. It's more important to you to know about football statistics than it is to know about why we're going to go to war and Americans are going to die. That's a great point. <laughs> and that was sort really of the end point. of the conversation because they're my friends and I'm not going to drive home the bayonet. But, um, <laughs> I mean, it's it's just absurd. Citizenship is not easy. Well, people know more, knew more about what was going on with, in Johnny Depp's bedroom Bedroom. Yeah, because while, they choose while to. Russia the was, you know, while this whole thing was starting, people were, well, I don't know about that, but, you know, boy, I've got an opinion about Amber Heard. Let me tell about you. About Amber Heard or Johnny Depp or what. You know, again, this country, you know, we got to know our own history of the people, by the people, for the people. That's what this country's about. That's Abraham Lincoln. You can go read George Washington, read the founding father's statement. And I'm not sitting here saying they're perfect because I know people are going to come back and say, oh, they're slave owners. They were this and that. Yeah, but they're founding fathers, too. They wrote down the first principles of what this country is supposed to stand for, uh, put it forward in a document called the Constitution that people take an oath to uphold and defend. Um, And one of the key elements there is citizenship. I mean, it's just it's 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 woven throughout. It ain't easy being a citizen of a nation that relies upon its citizens so that it does the right thing. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, this country will function properly if we, the people, do our jobs as citizens. But we don't. We elect people who then allow a Supreme Court to be stacked so that they pass something called Citizens United which then empowers corporations with the same rights as citizens, therefore diluting our value to this republic, uh, and we do nothing about it. No, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what your political party is. What I do recognize is that each one of you has a duty and responsibility as a citizen to be a participant in this process Mm -hmm. and not punt to somebody else to do the job for you because when you punt and you let them do the job, the job they're going to do may not be what you want. And then you've sort of lost the right to sit back and complain about. Yes. I I agree. Um, Something I wanted to ask you while it it just got on my mind, because you're so good at the the breakdown of what's going on currently in in the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and it, it seems to me like that attitude that you meant, mentioned about, you know, um, earlier, like it seems like that's the root cause of the problem for the Ukrainian. You know, it just seems like it's all politically driven and decisions get made like we're going to stay in this little town no matter what, <laughs> even though they're they're completely cut off in a so-called cauldron and there's, you know, they're getting bombed to death. And it's, but, you know, somebody in Kiev says, well, no, you can, you have to stand and fight because we need to, you know, I've got to talk to this politician on Tuesday and I want to make sure there's something good to talk about, you know? It just seems like it's really, oh, it's a cute little puppy you got there. Yeah. <laughs> I have to hold him or else he barks. <laughs> he, sorry. But, you know, like, just just for, for the listeners, I mean, who may not have seen some of your breakdown, the, give, it, give me like a little mini... Uh, uh, sort of Reader's Digest version of your breakdown of the difference between 
what our perception of the military situation is and what it really is? Well, war is an extension of politics. I warned you, if I let the dog down, he's going to bark. Uh, war is an extension of politics by other means. So the first thing we have to understand is that when we're going to speak about the military dimension, we need to understand the political dimension and we need to understand the economic dimension of this of this conflict. Uh, this conflict began not as a life and death struggle between Ukraine and Russia, but ra rather as an ongoing political effort by the United States and NATO to create a situation that weakened uh, Russia by stripping Ukraine away from its um, sphere of influence. Um, we were going to accomplish this not by threatening military force, but by threatening severe economic sanctions. I mean, again, America, hit rewind, go back to 2021. How many times did Joe Biden say he was going to cripple the Russian economy? with sanctions that they've never seen before, massive sanctions, serious sanctions, severe sanctions, whatever term you want to use, we were going to sanction Russia to death. And that was the goal. The goal was literally to cripple Russia to such an extent that the Russian people would rise up and, get rid of and remove Vladimir Putin from power. It was an effort at regime change. Well, one of the problems with the United States is that we vocalize in a very public manner policy uh, that is so far removed from reality and so disrespectful of Russia because we didn't for a second anticipate that not only was Vladimir Putin listening to what we were saying, but he was working with his very capable diplomats and economic experts to craft a response so that we, he could receive the economic sanction attack and respond in a way that minimized the damage to Russia while maximizing the damage to Europe and the United States. So when this conflict started, when Russia you know, began its special military operation, the primary focus of the West was on economically destroying Russia. Very little attention was paid to the actual what was going to happen on the ground because we actually believed that we would inflict so much harm so quickly on Russia economically that they would stop their military assault. It didn't work that way. Ruble did not become rubble. Ruble actually became much stronger because of the actions taken by uh, Vladimir Putin and his uh, government. Um, the, the Russians were able to uh, effectively adapt to this new reality, working with China to create this, you know, this new world order that we still haven't come to grips with what's really going on here, how the, the transfer of powers already occurred. Uh, America, we're number two. We're not number one anymore. We're number two, and we may even sink further. Number one is called China and Russia. They've redefined the global uh, you know, you know, uh, world order, uh, and we're just playing catch up. Now, what, so our initial response was to give the Ukrainians, you know, some 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 lightweight weapons, uh, javelin missiles, uh, Stinger anti-air missiles, things of this nature, just enough to delay the Russians, hold them off uh, until they collapsed. That didn't happen. What happened instead is that Russia masterfully shaped the battlefield. Um, and, and again, people need to understand, Ukraine had the second largest army in Europe. The first largest was Turkey. The second largest is Ukraine. 260,000 active duty troops, 600,000 reservists who for the past five years have been trained and equipped to NATO standards. This ain't Boy Scouts. This is the A team. Let me put it another way. The Ukrainian military, before Russia invaded, could defeat any military in Europe, bar none. Now, maybe the United States could bring reinforcements in, but the Ukrainian military would defeat the Polish army in a stand-up fight, the French army in a stand-up fight, the German army in a stand-up fight, the British army in a stand-up fight, the American army in a stand-up fight, because they were that big, that well-equipped, that well-armed, that well-trained. These guys are good. They're, the, they, they, they're, they're in the Premier League. 
Their problem is they're going up against the world champs, um, Russia, who's even better. But there, and, there, there's the problem is that we, not we, not you and I, or maybe even anyone listening, but the West collectively thought, oh, the Russians, they don't know how to, you know, wind a clock. <laughs> well, that's because the clocks they build are pretty simple. They're not as complicated as the clocks we build. Their clocks actually work when you drop them, work when it rains, works when it gets muddy. Um, they're they're not overproduced, overthought. They they have a functional arm. But the thing people need to say again, a quick you know lesson here. I don't want to get too far off the the major. In two thousand and eight, Russia fought a war, a short war, five day war against Georgia, the Republic of Georgia. Um, Russia won that war. Uh, they won it pretty handily, but it was ugly for Russia. When any military expert to go, and even the Russians admit it, they say tactically the Georgians, the Georgians beat us because the Georgians were American trained and the Georgians did things, maneuvered, coordinated. The Russians are going, these guys are really good. Now we'll, we blew them away with artillery and armor and all that kind of stuff, but Holy cow, if we had to go up against an army that was bigger, that fought to that that degree of tactical proficiency, we might lose. So the Russians revamped everything. And we saw that in 2014 uh, in Crimea. Remember the little green men? Mm -hmm. Suddenly the Russians weren't this inept force. They were a bunch of, you know, well-armed, well-equipped, well-organized, efficient, professional troops. They stopped being a conscript army they started being a primarily professional army with contract soldiers um they had great communication and then they just improved it over and over and over again the russian military that went into ukraine is a military that has since 2008 been singularly focused on defeating a nato style military they've been looking at everything we do They've been stuttering everything we do. And it's also a military that's very adaptive. And we've seen this in Ukraine, how they uh, initially went in and and they suffered some casualties because they made some assumptions, they made some mistakes, but they immediately adapted, reorganized, refocused, and they are winning this war hands down. Now, we're trying to stop them by pouring in this heavy equipment, you know, tens of billions of dollars of modern weaponry which is now it's being so sold bla- which is some some of which is now being sold on the black mar- arms sold on the black market but most of it's just being destroyed by the russians i mean i i, I don't know how to you know it, it, this this is my final sentiment on this for any american who thinks it's a good idea for us to provide this modern weaponry to ukraine so that they can better defend themselves against russia let me educate you for every piece of machinery we provide, weapon we provide the, the Ukrainian military, there will be Ukrainian soldiers that will have to use this. The only thing that's going to happen to these Ukrainian soldiers who use this weaponry is they're going to die. They're going to die violent deaths. And that's all that's going to happen to them. They can't win. They're not going to win. All they're going to do is die. So if you're encouraging our government to provide Ukraine with weaponry, What you're doing is encouraging the murder of Ukrainian soldiers. So you're a hypocrite in the extreme. I'm doing this for Ukraine. I'm doing this to support. No, all you're doing is supporting slaughter of Ukrainian soldiers. And if you care about Ukraine, understand this. At this rate, there will not be a Ukraine when this is done. Ukraine is on the verge of being eliminated as a nation state. When this conflict is over, there may not be something called Ukraine. It will be gone permanently because if you know anything about the Russians, when they say something, they mean it. They don't bluff. Right now, you've got the Russian leadership saying that not only are they not going to give the Donbass back, Lugansk, Donetsk, the original focus of this fight, they're never going to give Crimea back. But every piece of territory that they've occupied so far, any territory that's been stained with the blood of a Russian soldier will never again be Ukraine. They've also said that they now are compelled because Ukraine has received this weaponry to expand their territorial acquisition uh, and that territory will never be Ukraine. The city of Odessa is going to be Russian. All of southern Ukraine will be Russian in perpetuity. 
And if the Ukrainians don't cease and desist, then the Russians will never stop advancing. So there's no Ukraine left. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know who it was. It was either Sergei Lav Lavrov or uh, Med Medvedev. One of the two made a speech just the other day where they did sort of, he did sort of admit that the horizons are expanding. <laughs> that was Sergei Lavrov, yeah. Right. I'm just going to play the uh, station ID just for a second. We'll be right back in probably less than 10 seconds. From our studio in Midtown, this is Radio Kingston, WKNY, AM 1490, FM 1079, Kingston, New York. And if you're just joining me, you are listening to The Long Way Round here on Radio Kingston. Uh, and tonight I have a very special guest, uh, former UN arms inspector, uh, Scott Ritter, author of the forthcoming, or is, it, is the book out, Scott, or... The book is out. Yeah, they're they're actually public. They're actually printing it up as we speak. <laughs> Excellent. So the book is called Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika. And just to take a second before I, you know, I don't want to overshadow anything with the conversation about that very important period of history that you were deeply involved in. Let me just ask you what the 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 impetus to write the book. I mean. In, in the sense of, you know, not just like, oh, I'm going to pick up this book and learn some factual information. There's a lesson in there to be learned, I think. Well, I first started this book, um, I mean, about five years ago, just as a, as a personal uh, book. Uh, it, it, first of all, it, it would have been impossible to publish five years ago because um, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty um, contains a clause that prohibits either side from um, publicizing, um, you know, uh, information that's derived from the treaty. I see. So I was writing this more or less as just something that could exist, um, so that when uh, when they put my body in the ground, <laughs> um, my grandkids would be able to read something about a very unique time in history and say, "Wow, Granddad was pretty cool." It's incredible. I mean, when you think about what you did and what you went through, I mean, just the, the setting up that uh, facility, like, what was it, 700 miles? And, 700 miles uh, east of Moscow, man. The, 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 the mantra was, um, we got to get it right because there ain't no radio shack anywhere near <laughs> for us to get spare parts. If something breaks, it's broke. And you, um, apparently you got in trouble for donning Russian uh, traditional garb because apparently they have winter and it gets very cold there. The, the first winter, we... Uh, you know, we, we, we had our U S issued stuff and the Russians sort of looked at us and went, dude, uh, that's good fall clothing, but that ain't winter clothing. And they were right. It was, I mean, we're talking minus 50, minus 60, and sometimes minus 70 degrees. And we're with equipment that had been tested out at minus 20, minus 30, minus 70 wind with wind chill factor. I'm not saying it, but we're talking about deadly cold, uh, temperatures. And, um, you know, the only way my feet survived is I went to the local store and I bought, I bought something called a uh, Valinky, which are uh, the, the, the felt boots. And you, you put the Valinky on, you stuff some new paper, newspapers in the top and your feet are toasty warm. Um, to and everybody else was wearing their, you know, vapor barrier boots issued by the U S military. They were getting frostbit toes um, because the, the equipment just stops functioning at a certain temperature. So when we, we took this iconic photograph um, in December of, uh, 1988 outside the factory with an American flag. Uh, we have the inspectors there and, oh man, our leadership freaked out because we were just dressed in a variety of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of gear, but the, the, the sole purpose of which was to keep us warm. Right. But we certainly didn't look uniform and we certainly didn't look American. <laughs> well, just, just again, for the sake of the listeners, um, you know, basically what you were doing is there was, explain that the INF, treaty just in a nutshell and then why you ended up there doing those inspections and that's sure, the, the special the, machine. The INF treaty is Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. It, it actually was the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty and it dealt with short range ballistic missiles as well. But basically you're, you're dealing with a category of missiles that um, are from, you know, I, I'm going to get in trouble here because my, my memory is flawed, but you know, 500 to 5,000 um, miles, I think. Yeah, I, I just um, remember, so you're right. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, 
this treaty banned them, outlawed them. Said, no, no more. We're no longer going to allow these these missiles to exist. On both sides. On both sides. It was reciprocal in nature. Um, And so, you know, this treaty was negotiated. Now we had to implement it. And uh, initially the treaty was designed just to be simply both sides going over, getting a, uh, you know, a a shopping list. Uh, People would declare, this is what you built. You know, here it is, count it up, destroy it, et cetera. Very simple uh, disarmament process. The problem came, um, the treaty was going to be designed in December 1987. In November 1987, the Russians uh, suddenly came out and said, hey, we got a, we got an issue. You see, um, the SS-20 missile, um, the first stage of the SS-20 missile is uh, sort of identical to the first stage of the uh, SS-25, hmm. which means now that we have a verification problem because if we allow them to produce SS-25 missiles without having a presence at the factory to confirm that their SS-25 is not SS-20s, we can't be sure that they aren't assembling a covert force. Um, so we they came up with this thing called portal monitoring. That is, you would build a monitoring facility outside of the factory. You would, the factory would become, um, you know, a, a, there would be only one outlet from the factory. This case was a rail line. Uh, that Nothing else could leave the factory from any other direction. And we would be parked outside this rail line and inspect stuff as it came out of the factory. Um, but, you, the, the key, but it was like a sort of giant x-ray machine you were using. Yeah, the key piece of equipment there was this thing called cargo scan. Right. Uh, it was a $12 million um, gigantic um, radiographic imaging thing that was just far too complex and uh, for... <laughs> Treaty said we had to put it in, so we put it in. It led to a crisis between you know, that we had to overcome, uh, et cetera. But you know, we built this stuff, and it was awesome. It worked. We accomplished the impossible. There was a lot of people rooting against us, uh, especially in the United States. Jesse Senator Helms. Jesse Helms uh, and and uh, other conservatives, uh, people even within the Reagan administration, who were hardcore anti-arms control people who believe that America, instead of disarming, should be maximizing, um, you know, our, our superiority and, and things of that nature. Um, and they were waiting for us to fail. And believe me, we almost failed. It was tough doing what we were doing. But, you know, that one of the great success stories, and this is why I wanted to write it, because this was a huge success story. If you, you won't, what's in my book, you won't find anywhere else. Because you can't. I I have used documents that no one else has access to, uh, and they're documents that I wouldn't have been allowed to uh, to discuss, except for the fact that in 2019, uh, Donald Trump withdrew from the INF Treaty, and then the Soviets followed. So there's no more INF Treaty today. So he uh, did gone. something. It's finished. And so I'm now <laughs> freed from the prohibition right. of discussing it, and I feel that. You know, and, and that's that's where the true impetus came in, because I went, wait a minute, this is insanity. We have the greatest example of arms control success in history, mm-hmm. and they just undid it. The best way to rebuild it is to write the history of our success and put it out there as a template and say, guys, we can do this again. This is how we did it. This is what we had to overcome. This is how we cooperated with the Soviets. It is possible. We can do it, but you have to tell the story. And that's what I did is tell the story. Well, and, and it does harken back to, you know, the statement at the beginning of the show, that, you know, if, if we forget our history, we're doomed to some kind of rhyming repetition, you know, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. And it seems to me that the, the book does give you a sense that this actually is possible. <laughs> it's not some sort of fantasy idea. I mean, it almost seems like a fantasy fantastic idea in in light of today's environment you know when i talk about it right now i feel like who's going to believe me at least in the political world that that's even oh, capable you know we we had the same thing when when we first showed up in in Vodkensk, which is this town uh where the missile factory was you know that was a closed area no foreigners have been in Vodkensk other than german prisoners of war um since the russian revolution and um and now 30 representatives from enemy number one are arriving and the 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 uh, elvira um uh, gosh 
uh, I forget her. I, I'm sorry. I apologize, Elvira. She's the she's the editor of a, of the local newspaper in Vodkinska, Leninsky Put. Um, and she interviewed us, and she started off saying, "If you had talked to anybody six months ago about the possibility of thirty Americans being in Vodkinsk, it would have been fantasy. It would have been a fantastic story." So. You know, you're not alone in feeling that way. They felt the way back then. Everybody felt that way. It was fantasy. When I showed up in in, in June of 1988 as part of the advance party, you know, the first inspectors on the ground, that's one of my great claims to fame, is I was one of the first inspectors to implement on the ground in the Soviet Union to do this. Um, man, we were looked at like we were Martians uh, because we were Martians. Uh, the, the, the same concept. It was as feasible for a Martian to be walking through the streets of Vodkinsk as it was for an American. And yet here we were doing this job that nobody had ever conceived possible. And many people didn't believe it was possible. And yet we did it. You know, you and I share, <laughs> share a, uh, have a shared experience on a certain level. I, I myself, when our fam- my, fa- my father was involved in the uh, nuclear research industry and um we were on a sort of work sabbatical in germany this was back in the 70s and we spent some time and he, he was working in a nuclear research facility in a place called heilberg germany and as a vacation we went to berlin <laughs> because my mother <laughs> thought that would be very interesting so and i remember standing there at the wall you know sounds like a david bowie song um and just looking at that wall and looking at the people on the other side and looking at the staring faces of the the East German border police that just looked through you, and then getting on a bus and going through East Germany and, and the, the the local inhabitants sort of looking at you, and it just seemed like it was a bajillion miles between us. And then it all came together so quickly, and it's so it's a case in point that you know it's not impossible to, for us to be together and and love each other as opposed to just this whatever it is we're doing right now, you know, this. No, I, I, I start a chapter of the book um, talking about um, New Year's Eve, uh, 1988, um, when we received an invitation. We've been working now for, you know, uh, nigh on six months with our Soviet counterparts. Um, but we didn't really know them. I mean, we knew them as professionals, but we, we, we didn't know them as people. Mm-hmm. And, um, we got invitations to go to the homes of these uh, Soviet engineers who six, seven months ago were building these missiles. And now they were working with us to come up with a way to ensure these missiles were never built again. And, uh, you know, I went into the home of this guy and um, I, 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 it's hard to explain, you know, having a man whom you, viewed as the enemy, opening the door to his home and inviting you to come in to where his wife was, to where his children were, where they lived. And homes are intimate things. I mean, when you walk through that door, you are seeing the reality of a family's life. Um, and you suddenly were, I, I was overcome, overwhelmed with the just the, the reality that this guy is me. Mm-hmm. He's not some, you know, demon. He's not an enemy. You know, he doesn't have a map on his wall that shows my hometown with a bullseye on it. Uh, they have photographs of their family members. Um, you know, they have children that they love, that they care about. He has a wife that he adored. Um, and you saw the kids love him as a father, as a man. And it was just, one of these transformational moments um, in my in my personal life experience. You know, I'm not naive. I didn't walk out of there, you know, you know, singing uh, kumbaya. You know, kumbaya. But um, right. I did walk out of there saying, "Man, I got a lot to learn about life, about people." You know, that it's the world ain't black and white. <laughs> it's there's a lot of nuance out there. There's a lot of gray, and the most important thing is these guys are humans, mm-hmm. and if I treat them as humans. They'll treat me as a you, human. And the respect. And, together, us, and also the respect. I've heard you say that before. Mutual respect. Mutual respect. And then we can get the impossible done. Because I'll tell you what. 
that job, and if you read the book, I think it, it, it comes across how hard it was for us to do this job. This was not an easy job to do. Very, very difficult circumstances. Um, it required a lot of dedication, perseverance, professionalism, and it required a lot of mutual cooperation. And if we had not treated each other with respect, if we had not treated each other as humans, if we had not cooperated together as you know, fellow members of the global community trying to do better for the world, we would have failed. We would have failed. The fact that we succeeded is a victory for humanity. Well, you know, I, I think the secret to um, keeping people divided is to create this image in, you know, the population's mind of the other. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because by doing that, you, you've, you, you know, that's not a person. So if they get shot or blown up, it's, well, it's a target. It's not a, a human being. But, you know, when you think, oh, that person actually had a family and a child and now they're not, and all the consequences that go with that. Um, speaking of which, I'd like to get into some music. Maybe we can play a track before we go to a little break. Um, I love the way you've put together the, the song list. I really appreciate that so much. Hopefully we'll get through a good bit of this. Um, but uh, Fortunate Son by Crosby still... Uh, CCR, <laughs> Creedence, Creedence, Creedence. other 60s band. And you, you write, I grew up in Hawaii at the end of the Vietnam War. And my dad was a military career, career military officer. The song triggered an internal debate. I ain't no military son, but I was. I had inherited those star-spangled eyes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, um, <laughs> I think that, that song, I, I, a lot of people play it and say, you know, that's a, that's a rebellion song against the military. I played it and said, hell no, I am the star spangled son. I am the man who's rushing off to war. That's because that's the time I lived in. That's, uh, that was my calling. That was my duty. So that's how I view the song. All right. Well, here's number one on Scott's playlist, Fortunate Son, Creedence Clearwater Revival. back after these most important messages stay tuned for scott ritter here on radio kingston hi i'm Rachel. Hi, i'm Teresa. heads up kingston i'm kingston mayor steve noble 
we've updated our traffic patterns. Learn the new Broadway lane configuration with cycle tracks. Look for the cyclist traffic signals and green two-stage turning boxes. Push the button to use the new rapid flashing beacons at crosswalks. We're all safer when obeying the rules of the road. The life you save could be your own. Be a road hero. Hi, I'm Emily Flynn from Bike Friendly Kingston. We're happy to, happy to announce monthly slow rides this summer. Slow rides are guided group rides meant for all abilities done at a slow pace. They're a great way to explore Kingston neighborhoods and gain confidence riding a bicycle. We're riding together on the first Thursday of every month at 6 p.m. through October. They start at the parking lot at the YMCA of Kingston and Ulster at 507 Broadway. When you ride with us, you should wear a helmet, have front and rear lights, bring water, and wear comfortable clothing. Route links vary from 5 to 20 miles and are hosted by different bicycle leaders. Bike Friendly Kingston Slow Rides, first Thursdays at 6 p.m. at the YMCA. For more information, including cancellations and updates, check out Bike Friendly Kingston's events on Facebook. And the story of Kingston preview and exhibition ends uh, August 13th. The Matthews Person House is hosting local filmmaker and author Stephen Blauweiss for his new mini-exhibition, The Story of Kingston, beginning Saturday, July 30th. There will be a preview of the book, The Story of Kingston, co-authored by Stephen Blauweiss and Karen Berlowitz, which will contain 850 images of historic Kingston and Ulster County, all in full color. There will also be a history of Uptown Kingston Gallery featuring additional rare photographs. The Story of Kingston, presented by Stephen Blauweiss on July 30th, August 6th, August 13th, beginning at 11 a.m. at the Matthew Matthewis Pearson House, 74 John Street in Kingston. For more information, visit clerk.ulstercountynewyork.gov. That's clerk.ulstercountynewyork.gov. Welcome back to the show, and welcome back, Scott. Hi, how are you? Doing great, thanks. <laughs> you know, I was listening to that track in the headphones, and I'm like, man, that stuff sounded good. <laughs> I mean, just, yeah. you know, it's like... Uh, you know, I'm a, my day job is I'm a record producer and musician, and so, of course, you know, well, not to put myself above or below anyone, but, you know, I listen to music in a certain way, like you probably look at military strategy as in a certain <laughs> way, you know, a different viewpoint. But, you know, I'm, but when you hear a song where it's like, it's, it's just a great, like, performance, the lyrics, what he's talking about, the sound, you know, the way the guitar sounds and stuff, you're just like, that's perfection. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's one of the reasons why I I, I put it out there because it it for me it it was a uh, it it is a perfect song. <laughs> yeah, did you ever read the book by uh, the Vietnam veteran, fortunate son? Yeah, um, I uh, the... gosh, Ron, Ron Kovic, I think. Right, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it was a pretty intense book because he came from a you know he's almost like the picture perfect storybook image of that song like rich kid you know could have gone to university but nope wanted yep. to go and fight in vietnam Went to Vietnam, yeah. yeah so that's another piece of our american history that uh i hope people don't forget about because there's <laughs> <laughs> god almighty if we ever have to do that again um how about uh let's see now what we got here Lido shuffle by boss skaggs you write <laughs> <laughs> you're right do you mind me being you? Is that okay? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we, we live, I, I don't think I can manage it. We lived in Turkey from 1975 to 77. It was one of the great adventures of my childhood. In the summer of 1976, I, sent, I signed up to help repaint Turkish orphanage and another, with another American. We spent two weeks painting the building. He had one tape, Boz Skaggs. We had a blast painting the orphanage. The entire album is carved into my memory, the song foremost. So this is Buzz Skaggs with Lido Shuffle. We better start it from the beginning. Eh? Be <laughs> That's the best Sorry. part of the song. <laughs> I know. Jeez. I mean, that. Lido missed the boat that day. He left the shack. But that was all.
was Lido by Boz Skaggs. That was a by special request of my very special guest, Scott Ritter. <laughs> I got to tell you, I mean, that, just listen to that song. Um, I, I don't want to get too far off track here, but, you know, Turkey, growing up in Turkey was just, it, it's something I don't think the average American um, can, can understand. Uh, it was in 19, this was, you know, I was there from 1975 to 1977. Um, and of course, the Middle East was exploding at that time, and so was Turkey. There was uh, a, a great deal of uh, of internal political unrest, oftentimes violent. Um, and yet, you're trying to have a normal childhood in this. And this was the wild, wild west. Um, literally, there were no rules. Um, and as a teenager, as a boy, <laughs> <laughs> curse and a blessing, I should think. We would take we we take full advantage of that. And uh, you know, just a quick story. You know, we. Stamp collecting became an adventure. We we I, I had two friends of mine, um, and we'd go around from embassy to embassy and uh, ask them for their mail so we could get the stamps off of them so we could collect stamps. And uh, we went to the Israeli embassy one night. It was a very wet and uh, rainy night, wind howling, and um, of course Israel is the center of you know terrorism and there, everything was concerned. And so we went to the guard shack and um, we were trying. We were dressed in black and it was cold, so we had. Uh, <laughs> Balakov was oh over God, our face, lucky didn't and we just shot. looked like the, like like the world's worst dudes. And we're we're knocking on the door, and he's telling us to get away, and we're saying we want to come in, and and uh, we go to open the door. The wind catches it; it f- flies. The, it was a glass door. It hit the glass, shattered. The guy pulls out an Uzi, and we start running, and he's shooting after us. Oh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, so you got your first live so, fire training. Well, that was it, man. The stamp collecting became a very life and death thing for us. And that literally was normal for two years. That's why I, I, my mom views Turkey as one of the great nightmares of parenting. I view Turkey as one of the greatest adventures uh, a, a child could ever go through. I've, I've had the fortune of, of traveling through Turkey a number of times. And it was, it was actually a really eye-opening adventure. I mean, this is about 20, 25 years ago, I think. Yeah. I mean, not, not least of which was the quality of the food. Oh, the food's great. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, I thought, oh boy, I better not try one of these roadside vendors. You know, I'll get, I'll get like food poisoning. But it was amazing. Like the it's amazing vegetables. food. You got to try the roadside vendor. That's the only way to do the food. <laughs> Fantastic. And, you know, once you get over, you know, having to be dragged into a, well, once you get out of the big cities, you know. Drink, you can only drink so much tea and look at rugs, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but I, I, I actually traveled there to go to the eastern part of Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine, Ukraine on the bum and brain. Turkey, as we're supposed to call as we're meant to call it now. Turkey. Um, Turkey. It's the, that's where the Kurdish population yep. mostly lives. And yep. I, was, I was sort of adventuring in sort of amateur photojournalism. And I wanted to just get a sense of what was going on there. You know, and and this is obviously when the the lead up to the you know invasion of Iraq was. You could sense there was something going on, like with the Kurds and the northern Iraqis and the Saddam and so so forth. And it was it was very scary. You know, I, I don't think a lot of people could ever understand or experience that when you actually feel like someone could lock you up and throw away the key. Throw away the key. A bit like <laughs> yeah. Julian Assange. You know, I don't know if you. Really, Words of encouragement for him, but uh, is, have you ever met Julian or talked to him? I have not. I have uh, the utmost respect for him. Uh, I think what's happening to him is a travesty for not only his family, uh, but for his cause, journalism, First Amendment, things that Americans are supposed to cherish. Um, and yet we're, we're you know, disgracing ourselves uh, by prosecuting this man for doing that which we give Pulitzer Prizes to American journalists for doing. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a yeah. I mean, there's I talked about this recently with some, another. I think it was George Galloway actually, and you know, it's it's not only wrong on so many legal levels. There's no legal basis for what's happening right. at all. Zero, not any. <laughs> but the humanitarian aspect of the way he's being treated is just yeah. if if you know how, who you know. I think George said this is like who are we? To point the finger, for example, because you hear this over and over and over again from not just, I actually hear it more from people that are my friends. That, yeah, but the Russians, blah, blah, you know, they're human rights. They don't, you know, gay people get locked up and thrown away in the jail forever. And, 
you know, they, they have no rights there and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, look what they do that are journalists like this guy Navalny or whatever. And then you say, yeah, not to do a yeah, but, but, you know, we're, how can we possibly have any kind of moral standing when that situation with Julian is happening is, is, is my point, you know? We have no moral standing. So it's, it's, that's just the bottom line. You know, we're a nation of hypocrites. Yeah. Well, on that fine note, <laughs> do some more music. I had to sound off on that because it's just so upsetting, you know. Uh, although there's a film that's just come out. Um, it's called, uh, what the heck's it called? It's a, um, Ithaca is the name of the film. It's about uh, Julian's father, uh, John Shipton. And uh, his son, his brother, and sort of just trying to sort of help him negotiate the American, uh, whatever, <laughs> system. Uh, let's see, Just My Imagination is the next on your list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't say anything about that, but why is it on your list? Oh, I, I you know, I, I actually, I sent it to you. And, uh, no, I mean, yeah, this was from Germany. And, um, you know, it, it, Turkey was this grand adventure because it was lawless. Germany is the antithesis of lawless. Okay. Germany is organized. It's order. It's discipline. Um, it's beautiful. It was wonderful. Uh, we lived on the economy. Um, but we also lived, like, as I, I think I alluded to it earlier, in a constant state of terror uh, that the world could come to an end as we know it. And, um, you know, I was, a, I was a, a teenager, a junior, then a senior. I graduated from uh, Kaiser Southern American High School. And... Um, you know, like like most guys, uh, I think teenagers, you know, music does sort of define that experience. I mean, you listen to music, you you you, a song becomes uh, attached to a memory, etc. Et uh, and the Rolling Stones album, Some Girls, um, basically defined the, uh, <laughs> the, the the summer of 1978 for me, and. Um, you know, there, I could have picked any any song from that album, um, but just just my imagination was uh, was a song because uh, I had a crush on a girl uh, named Betsy Ensign, and uh, just my imagination was the song that uh, you know I looked out the window and watched you, watched her as she passes by. I mean, that was that was me, man, <laughs> daydreaming away <laughs> like all teenage boys do. Betsy, if you're listening. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Well, and it's actually, actually, that's a cover song, right? It's originally. It's a cover. Yeah. It's not, it's not an original Stone song, I forget who but it's right. a great cover. Yeah. It's a, it's, well, it's actually, all, for me, it's kind of almost like the definitive version. So Rolling Stones, Just My Imagination, as per request by Mr. Scott Ritter. I know. It's supposed to work. <laughs>
Stones, just my imagination. Oh, actually, for the record, that song was written by, uh, let's see, this is Norman Whitfield and Barrett Strong, and it was recorded originally for the Temptations, it was the Temptations that it, for, for Motown Records. But, yeah, it's, that's really a definitive version of that song. I think so. <laughs> and I, I could listen to the Rolling Stones all day and all night just because I love th- Charlie Watts, <laughs> the drummer. <laughs> I, I, I'm a huge tra- I, I Look, that was the t- music of my childhood. It, it wanted, I mean, the Rolling Stones was, I mean, the, the band. I, I saw them in 1981 during the Tattoo You tour. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a whole different story. But I had the opportunity to take my daughters to go see the Rolling Stones when they played in, um, in, in New York City um, uh, a couple years ago. And uh, I have to say, um, it was just spectacular. Um, I, it was such a proud, <laughs> like a really proud moment to be able to share that with my daughters and say, this is the stuff that I listened to growing up and to have them identify with it. And the band was just outstanding. Charlie Watts was drumming for them then. I, you know, I loved, I love Mick Jagger. I love Keith Richards. <laughs> I like Ronnie Wood. Um, but Charlie Watts is dead now. And I don't, I, I, I have a hard time you know, visualizing the Rolling Stones without Charlie Watts. He he was sort of the glue that held that band together. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of felt the same way, although I, have, I haven't I have seen them doing their new, latest tour, but uh, some of the video clips I've seen, like on YouTube and stuff, you know, they're still, you know, it's still Mick and Keith, and, you know, there's that vibe there between the two of them. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah, that no, magic, it, was, they, it, was, it was magic. Those, those songs. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and, you know, I should say that, you know, for... A lot of the songs, we're probably not going to get through any more than no, 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 no. But some I, of them I wouldn't recommend getting through. The, no, no, the but, rest but, of the evening. <laughs> but what I what I often do is, if the following week I'll do a, a show where like I include the music from the previous show that we didn't get through. So, <laughs> but I, you know what? I'm really curious to hear. Uh, well, I I, I want to ask you one question first of all. Sure. It's been really bothering me for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> it's can you explain to me the verification equation? The verification <laughs> equation. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go to the book though because oh, it's uh, but it's, it's real. Stuff. It's I uh, thought you knew that algebra off by heart. Well, it, it's or just you don't have to the, explain the, it. You can just tell me the the purpose. Well, the here. reason why I put the verification equation in there is arms control was being managed by a bunch of um, theorists, and the 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 verification equation basically uh, it, it 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 compares a a nation's ability to detect, uh, you know, so basically uh, satellite uh, satellites that could take photographs um, as it relates to a nation's willingness to cheat as it relates to the outcome. Meaning if I'm going to enter into a disarmament um, process, I need to have... <clears throat> the ability to detect a nation's cheating so that the risk is worth what we're trying to accomplish, that we don't want to get into a situation where we set ourselves up for failure. So prior to the INF Treaty, the verification equation uh, hinged on what we called national technical means, satellites. Uh, And there was a feeling that while the satellites gave us some capabilities, it wasn't sufficient to overcome the temptation on the part of the Soviet Union to cheat uh, and therefore, um, you know, retain capability they weren't supposed to have. We then, with the INF Treaty, the, it was the first time that the human factor was brought in. Humans, on-site inspectors going on the ground. And by introducing the human factor, we altered radically the verification equation. Now we actually had a comprehensive means of verifying uh, compliance with a treaty that could defeat almost every cheating scenario Mm -hmm. that you could come up with so that we would have confidence in the outcome and it would achieve the objective that we're trying to, that we're pursuing through disarmament. I see. I hope that made sense. That makes, makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you know, when I think back to the most, uh, one of the more the more memorable uh, existential statements of of, of the uh, 2003 was when Donald Rumsfeld 
Rumsfeld, the then Secretary of Defense, said something about uh, it's not the known knowns or the unknowns. It's the known. <laughs> yeah, I thought, well, boy, this guy's tripping. <laughs> like, what drugs it's are you taking? It's the known unknowns. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was like, wow, move over, Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus. But, but Rumsfeld was the personification of the mindset that existed um, when when the verification e e equation was uh, was was first put out there. You know, it was put out there as a way of um, <clears throat> of preventing meaningful arms control. Meaning that it was this kind of thought process, this kind of uh, uh, algebraic approach, was done on purpose by bureaucrats to retard the ability of the United States to move forward in a meaningful fashion on arms control because it perpetuated the notion that because we couldn't verify disarmament is therefore are in our interest to overcome the Soviet threat by building more weapons. Um, and so the, this introduction of the on-site inspection aspect, the humans, uh, it was devastating for these people. And that's another reason why they were so determined to see us fail. Is that why, I mean, is that why, the, is that why President Biden doesn't like you? <laughs> well, there's many reasons why he doesn't like me, but uh, yeah, that's, that's among them. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty boy. Scotty boy. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a trip. Well, we're just going to uh, go to a couple of promos the last, last little bit, and we'll be right back with Scott Ritter. Please stay tuned. Hi, I'm Rachel McChrystal from Woodstock Farm Sanctuary in High Falls, New York. Our Saturday public education tours focus on the rescued farmed animals here at the sanctuary, their rescue stories and what their lives are like here, and the industries where they come from. All of our animal residents have been rescued from animal agriculture. When you tour Woodstock Sanctuary, you can make connections up close with animals who are most often seen as food or commodities, and who are largely hidden from public view. Tours are Saturdays at 10, noon, and 2, but the 10 a.m. tours are more suitable for young children. Tickets are $15 and can be purchased on our website, woodstocksanctuary.org. Radio Kingston. Many voices. Muchas voces. Many voices. One community. Hi, everybody. I'm Warren Lawrence. And this is Manuel Blas. Join us every weekday during the noon hour for Lunchbox Oldies. We will play the best from the 60s and the 70s. And remember to call for your request. And every day we feature the Lunchbox Lyric Contest. Name this song and you will win some great prizes. That's Lunchbox Oldies every noon hour, Monday through Friday. With me, Manuel. And me, Warren. Here on Radio Kingston. AM 1490, FM 1079, anytime on RadioKingston.org. Well, it's always this time of the night I start singing the Carol, Carol Burnett song. <laughs> it's so nice we had this time together. Time together, great song. <laughs> um, but I, I really do, it's, it's gone by so quickly. Uh, you've been really entertaining and engaging to listen to. Um, I'd like you to introduce the next song, Scott, uh, Prove It All Night. I want to play that because I've never heard this recording and I love Bruce Springsteen. Oh, <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> I mean, look, Bruce Springsteen, like the Rolling Stones, was was a definitive thing. I, I first got turned on to Bruce Sting, Springsteen when I was um, in Germany. Uh, Darkness on the Edge of Town album was uh, was 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 a was a big one. Um, I went in the army and uh, was stationed in New Jersey for a while. And of course, Asbury Park is there, <laughs> and uh, I, can't get away I went it. down to the Stone Pony and uh, had the thrill of seeing uh, um, Bruce Springsteen uh, go on stage and. Um, and play with Southside Johnny, who was playing there. So, I mean, it was just, it was, it was great. But then I, you know, I go to college. I went to college at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And um, I had a friend who was a big Bruce fan. And, um, you know, college is a time where, you know, you're, you're learning about life, about the world, about yourself. And so there's a lot of really introspective moments where you're sitting there just thinking about it. And music, again, plays a very important role in that. And a song that I did much of my most productive thinking to was uh, Prove It All Night uh, by Bruce Springsteen. And the, and the, and the thing that gets me, and it's still, I have to admit it today, if, I'm, if I need to think, I will shut out the lights, I will put this song on, I will listen to this opening guitar intro, and it will create genius because <laughs> it is genius. It's the best guitar intro in the history of guitar intros. Mm -hmm. 
to follow. And the the great thing about this recording is it's gosh, he's so young, right? It, he's playing in Passaic, New Jersey. So it's Bruce Springsteen. Well, when you see the video too, uh, there there's people in the front row, uh, <laughs> and you're just watching their face going, "Are we really watching this happen now?" Because it's it's him right there in front of them making magic. Right. <laughs> Don't get to see that often enough. Bill, thanks, Oscar. Bill, thanks, Oscar. guys you think you're ready to prove it all night
prove it all night scott <laughs> and it goes on for a while it's great it's amazing i've never seen that before wow he's so young too and steve stevens little steven doesn't even look like an italian mobster in that video <laughs> no no he looks like a rock and roller <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i wanted to just you know i always like to end off the show on on some kind of a positive note you know um and i've heard you say this many many times you you say it with a, with no apologies you say i love this country well, I do love this country. I mean, I, I'm willing to die for this country. Um, you know, but what makes this country, there's a couple things that make this country great. One is the potential of this country. I mean, we are unique in that we are endowed with a constitution that um, celebrates liberty, individual liberty, uh, freedoms, etc. cetera. Um, and man, if we could ever breathe life into this document and, 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 and live up to its potential, what good things we could do. Um, and I'm also in love with the American people. I mean, I'm critical of us. I'm critical of myself. I'm critical of everybody. I mean, my God, we're human, so we're not perfect. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I'm 61 years old. And I've been around the block a couple times and I've... I've traveled the world. The world is full of very interesting people. Um, I love their culture. I love their history. But I love my culture. I love my history. I love the history of all the American people. I love the fact that when we say American people, we can't speak of a singularity. We have to speak of polarity. Boy, there goes that big word. But it's a, it's, it's a plurality. Hmm. We come from different walks. You know, we don't have a caste system. I know people say, oh, yes, we do, but we don't. We're not born into a caste system. We all have the ability to become something uh, different than what we were born into. Um, and we are a good people. That's the thing that, that, you know, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. But at the end of the day, we are a good people. The average American will give the shirt off of his or her back to help a fellow human being in need. Um and if we can just capture this humanity, this, this inherent sense of good, of decency, and turn it into a national cause, man, what good we could do. I mean, get rid of Citizens United, re-empower to the citizen, we the people of the United States of America, and there's no limit to the good things we could do collectively together in friendship with the other good people of the world. Well, with that... Excellent thought in mind. I really do appreciate you uh, giving some of your valuable time to us, and I'd love to have you back again for an update. And uh, thanks so much for the music. And, well, thank you. Uh, and, um, it's been a pleasure. And, and as my friend Garth Hudson says, uh, Gar Garth Hudson was from the band, uh, the band, mm -hmm. says, if the good Lord's willing and the crick don't rise, we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Scott. Take care. Thank you, sir. God bless. Thank you. Bye.